Preface The author of the book, viz. The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, Neil Ferguson, reveals the significance of money in tandem with human existence. He has meticulously traced back the evolution of this pecuniary element from as early as ancient Mesopotamian civilization to its present alarming turbulence and instability, observed all across the globe similar to the concerns over global warming. The progressive ascent has rightly been termed as planet finance. The author vividly enumerates the prolonged history of money, credit, and banking. To be precise, it accounts for growth of money as a trading entity, establishes a link with successive progress and influence on the modern socio-economic genre, and identifies its smart entry into the realm of 21st century stir and spectacle. Published in 2008, this book was converted into a documentary with successful streaming at high-regarded television channels like PBS USA and Channel 4 UK. It boasts of an International Emmy Award, conferred in 2009. About the author, Neil Ferguson is deemed one of the most celebrated historians the world has ever witnessed. He has authored a plethora of insatiable creations that the readers feel fortunate to delve deep and admire. The list of books is countless, but some of the cardinal compositions need special mention. The House of Rothschild, Paper and Iron, The Cash Nexus, The War of the World, The Pity of War, The Ascent of Money, Empire Colossus, The Great Degeneration, Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, High Financier, The Square and the Tower, are some of the prolific masterpieces to treasure. Born in Glasgow, the United Kingdom, in the year 1955, Neil Campbell Ferguson is known to be an eminent Scottish historian who is presently associated with Hoover Institute under the aegis of Stanford University, USA, in the capacity of a senior fellow. The students of Harvard University were also blessed with his teachings, and in turn had been fortunate enough to have entered the ever-shining corridor of wisdom. Summary It will not be out of context to mention here that Neil Ferguson is an intellectual who effortlessly goes about possibly all areas of intellect. He is fundamentally a historian, but has an equal flair in economics as well. Ferguson possesses an uncanny knack of detecting shortcomings of conventional establishments and power axes, especially in cases of power mongers who transgress their predefined boundaries and inflict damage to the governance of a region. The Scottish born Neil Campbell Ferguson rose to prominence in late twentieth century when he de when he debuted with his non fiction work, viz. The Pity of War, wherein he severely criticized Britain having committed an historical blunder the world had ever known by participating in World War I, and in effect ruined its empirical existence to the minuscule. Subsequently, it lost its superpower status. Whatever may be the repercussions of Ferguson's arguments, he always assumes the center stage and divulges the facts with such tempo that the audience becomes mesmerized and almost unanimously appreciates his oratory skills embezzled with choicest dictions. Ferguson's latest book, The Ascent of Money, suitably subtitled as A Financial History of the World, has been able to move the entire international academics with his subtle style of writing combined with a systematic display of logic and reasoning. Similar to Ferguson's other works, viz. Empire Colossus and The War of the World, the subject book was also converted into television documentary series. The ascent of money complements the ascent of a human being. Ferguson continues with his contention that every historical event has an undercurrent of financial implication. He traverses through the back history and recalls how the Duke of Wellington and Nathan Rothschild were able to tame Napoleon at Waterloo by arranging ample monetary resources for the British Army. The morale of the British Army was livened up because of the reinforcement of timely resources by selling bonds and stockpiling gold with remarkable efficiency. 
Rothschilds were considered the most solvent bankers of the era of 19th century British regime and across the continent. They also had a vital role in the defeat of the South during the Civil War, as they declined to put money on Confederate cotton collateralized bonds. The Royal Spaniards had accumulated high bullion stakes from the developing world, but they ultimately failed to maintain their supremacy. On the contrary, the Dutch and British regimes were touching the zenith because of their well-planned and ornate banking systems that Spain was lacking at that juncture. Also, the French Revolution was signified by the unethical plotting by a Scotsman named John Law, who was bestowed the public finance by the French monarchy in token of gratitude for his generous financial aid. John Law went forward and unscrupulously ventured for subprime mortgage bubble, applying little intelligence and plenty of stupidity. The result was obvious. The French economy collapsed instantly with far-reaching effects and rendered the French citizens penniless for generations. Ferguson was also apprehensive of America's financial plight and expressed his doubts in the subject book that the next turn might be for this superpower due to its unhealthy money management. The apprehensions are particularly crucial because of the unprecedented financial crisis since the catas catastrophe of the Great Depression. He contends that the United States is probably facing financial pull-up. The gnawing magnitude of debts incurred, especially in the perspective of China, Ferguson aptly calls the present status as Chimerica. In reciprocation, China has virtually become the lender of the last resort to America. It was all fair trade relations between the two countries until the breakout of the present fiscal crisis, affecting the entire world economy. The consumers in America were on a buying spree and indiscriminately used their credit profiles for buying goods from China. The Chinese government, on the other hand, amassed a large chunk of foreign exchange surpluses out of it and reinvested prudently with Wall Street, aiming at lending funds to the prodigal Americans. The whole process was so cohesive and spontaneous that it appeared as if marriages made in heaven, Ferguson quipped. But the harmony was short-lived because the relationship was based on unholy collusion, both carrying their interests. The availability of easy money augmented the bank lending, issuance of bonds, fresh monetary derivatives, which was all evident in planet finance since 2000. The Asian savings glut had prevailed over the American consumer market from 2000 to 2006. There was no scarcity of either supply of money or availability of consumer durables. Everything was in order. The difference was that the products were not domestic. They were all imported from China. The U.S. mortgage arena was replete with funds injected from China, and any American citizen could get 100% mortgage with no income, no employment, and no real purchasing power. The policy was to borrow and pay interest. Ferguson has named this Great Depression as Chimerica. The global imbalance was at its peak. Like Ferguson's past three documentaries based on his works, The Ascent of Money also seems to be a carefully designed script for television streaming. Ferguson deviates from an historical analysis of the ancient 17th century monetary system, returns to the 21st century Great Depression, and again focuses on post-Katrina New Orleans, Memphis, for framing an in-depth assessment of hurricane damages and the plight of the state going bankrupt and the entire events to be documented for American Public Broadcasting System, PBS. The book, in comparison with the impact it has created in public mindset and carrying a demanding subtitle, A Financial History of the World, is quite light-weighted, 360 pages only, and ideally written for the sake of television viewers. It is not fair to attribute the financial crisis on Chimerica alone. The internal fiscal policies are also responsible for the artificial crisis, be it the negligence of the business norms or controlling the subprime mortgage market. In the end, Ferguson himself seems to concede that the fabricated financial system and its accuracy is not foolproof, 
and the inherent intricacies are the determiners of fiscal collapse. Neil Ferguson is himself in bewilderment and contemplates whether the Darwinian evolution of humankind is the cause of the effects in the world is witnessing now in terms Chapter one, of financial terms. How to justify the human existence. Neil Ferguson takes the money matter in his stride to narrate the human activities backed by the progress of the fiscal realm from its root to the present gigantic structure. According to the Christian religion, Money is the source of possible evils that will corrupt in the course of its use. Other religious sects deem it as a bone of contention that invites a series of dissension. The protagonists consider money as core bondage of servitude. Nonetheless, Neil Ferguson, in his book The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, is quite determined with the substance that the word money, in its broader spectrum, constitutes the fundamentals of human development from past to the present. Besides, Ferguson also conveys that the financial framework is the essence in the backdrop of twists and turns of the civilization the world has ever seen from time immemorial. Ferguson is deeply judged by his clarity of thoughts and optimism, which rightly reflects on his style of presentation when he enters into the origin of financial institutions and their relevance to society. So many pertinent questions always stir a human intellect as to what does money mean? What factors do separate bonds, debitures, and stocks? What are the principal activities of banking institutions? What is precisely the function of a hedge fund? Why people strive for real estate and insure their lives and properties from ensuing big risks? All these questions aptly relate to the present scenario of economic warfare. Ferguson goes deeper down the crust and questions both mass and class why the free economy does not stand by the regular surge of economic recession. Subprime credit policies by the banks and financial institutions, leading to accumulation of non-productive assets and property mortgage, are matters of grave concern which are coexisting with the so-called advance economic growth. Ferguson has interwoven the factual ingredients in such an organized way that anyone who belongs to the related clan of experts can fathom the outcome to a great extent. In other words, one can interpret at least 45% of the inflexible monetary terminologies and principles contained within. It is a praiseworthy gesture when the elite historians are not ardently critical of the major elements of the book, and Ferguson indisputably stands his ground, carefully averting the snags of cliché, historical creations by many historians. Neil Ferguson is of the view that modern civilization owes its ascendancy to the pinnacle of glory because of four golden centuries of relentless economic growth. He brings about this distinct financial development in the context of a contemporary fiscal whirlwind, which has its inherent intricacies. He also investigates how money has transformed into fresh instruments and entities, and invited features that opened the door to its frequent users, governed by insatiable demands in a congenial atmosphere. The instruments that have helped the members of the society to produce more wealth or indulge in excessive perseverance, have favored the fittest to survive in the struggle for existence. Those select few are rightly sitting at the unassailable helm of affairs. The positive transformation has not happened in a day conjuring up a magical spell. It occurred in sporadic intervals in the depth of protracted historical upheavals. At the outset, money in the form of currency took over, rendering a fitting finale to the much agonizing barter system. This distinct change has been seen in a dominating form in the medieval period itself. However, the maiden use of money has a dubious distinction in the minds of economists due to lack of proper evidence. The various stages of evolution of money are not specific to unearth, and the sea change in its form in different ages of civilization has to undergo Chapter more two. research work. Progressive Phases of Fiscal Tools Ferguson has appositely opined that those people were fortunate who had an abundant exposure to the highly skilled and consummate tools of financial management in older days. The efficient tools of money management are as under Covenants and Bonds. 
In older days, the monarchical setup and the rulers of the Middle Ages had marginalized the patronage of banking activities, and common mass did not have the opportunity to get involved. Over time, the monarchy had bisected in two classes, viz. absolute monarchies and constitutional monarchies. In later stages, the democratically elected governance had started its emphatic journey all over the world. In all cases, the government had contemplated and introduced the concept of bonds and secured the accrued interests for the benefit of purchasers of bonds post-maturity. Gradually, this concept had become a fully developed bond market at the beginning of the 14th century and thrived further, dominating the financial environment. The medieval rulers and landlords were highly encouraged to safeguard and popularize this unique source of fund management. This eventful step resulted in the development of fund-based markets, now open to public participation in a big way, with proper regulations and control still vested in the hands of the rulers to suit their interests. The cost of money transactions was all-time low, which favored the rulers in diverting the huge war funds in securing productive bonds. All energies were then pivoted around bond warfare, and the battles won or lost in the money market. Banking Operations As and when money got recognition as a negotiable instrument, i.e., people came to know about its value as the only means of transaction, the availability got restricted and it was duly channelized for borrowing and lending through the gamut of financial institutions. Hence, developed the concept of banks and banking clearinghouses for a wider range of utilization of money and finance. Insurance Upsurge In light of the whopping success of shares, bonds, and debentures, the next action on the part of the community chieftains was to assess the market to fragment big risks in tiny pieces for seamless risk coverage. Insurance and pension funds were matched with the economies of scale, i.e., advantages received, in running the scale of operations of a business entity. Also, the law of averages was included as a principal element while calculating the risk factor on human life to provide for adequate financial protection. The large corporate bodies constituted in this area had attained another remarkable achievement in assessing the component of protection against big risk. The risk assessment was performed in an environment where financial risk was a substantial factor that could turn the tables against all assumptions. Nevertheless, the amassing of financial remodeling had already inclined toward the Western lobby who were now equipped with all economic resources to take over the major spaces on the planet. Stock Market Volatility As the world entered the era of the 17th century, the prominent financial institutions began cajoling the societies and states. This untiring process was not only confined to borrowing and lending, but it also initiated raising equity to share markets. The matter could only grow in the domain consisting of pre-existing bond markets and general territories, ensuring further gains, i.e., the benefits acquired from financial tools that shifted the focus from war to trade and commerce. In Ferguson's perspective, revolutionary monetary revamping motivated the Western movement to attain financial supremacy. The Real Estate Focus The stock market derives like futures and options were at its unassailable summit with exquisite innovative ideas. It had allowed space in the larger sphere of public sector corporate and governments as well as individual quarters. Buoyed by the positive interventions on the part of the government, the surplus stock market funds were successfully diverted toward real estate business. This unique diversion of funds had an exceptionally positive impact on the potential solvent class in Western countries, and they started investing more and more on properties, and had a flourishing run as industrialists and property developers. According to Ferguson, it was the most organized dynamic investment effect in the 18th century Western consortium. The End of Imperialism Across the Globe the community elevation combined with the economic properties, such as stock markets, banks, insurance, and real estates, had a better performance in the long run 
than in short bursts as feudalism in dark ages had a less growth impact than today's highly developed technological ambience. The community in the Middle Ages saw feudalism at its peak and hindered large-scale money management and financial intermediation. On the contrary, in a democracy, the financial growth takes its wings with a free and fair allocation of resources. The result is an effortless attainment of preordained goals. The economic activities that had evolved in the Western countries were tailor-made for implementation of wealth policies and high standard of living, irrespective of stature. Following these footsteps, the qualities of the West had an impact on the economies of the rest of the world. It was initiated during the age of imperialism and transcended to the global boundaries. The journey from one environment to the other was very significant, be it the riddles of Malthusian population theory, the scientific developments, enforcement of legal statutes, and the mundane Chapter agricultural three. activity. Money in the Making An Analysis Neil Ferguson has described the history of money as a symbol of financial growth and told the story of its transformation from primitive non-entity to the modern necessity. Thus, it transpires that implementation of the advanced financial basics was founded by the Western countries, and gradually it became a domestic utility all over the world. It is worth considering that Ferguson is quite specific in using occasional metaphors for money which ultimately proves to be an effective approach. He also throws light on financial history and declares that it is an outcome of institutional metamorphosis and human tendency for natural preference. Ferguson has divulged some key features from his illustrious books, which are as follows. The basic institutions, which still exist, are the most efficient in terms of performance, and that is universally accepted. The very purpose of serving own interests is the hallmark of the surviving institutions till the end. Therefore, the selfish attitude of the countries and corporate expansion across the globe should be encouraged. These are the apparent ingredients, and many more alike are mentioned in the book, carrying an exclusive agenda, aiming at averting the focus on quasi-rational wisdom. During the discussion, one might have observed that how Ferguson has designed his logic in linking the history of money to the virtues of imperialism, and driven the point home that how it holds good for the remaining world economy. Thus, one can tag this book as another meticulous effort on the part of Ferguson to cater to an avant-garde doctrine in favor of the monarchy. Ferguson may not be so passionate and forceful about his political ideologies, so to say, However, he possesses within himself the aura of a British free trader, i.e., the traditional British craving to identify the debt defaulters. Common people may not be well versed with financial terminology, and often misunderstand the concept of imperialism, and overlook the gains that can be drawn out of it. The nearest component here to grab in terms of social skill sets is the gold standard which, by any stretch of the imagination, is a menacing deception of stability. Also, it is beyond Ferguson's taste to compare labor with workforce management. He is doing his utmost to put on a monarchical British mask over his working-class demeanor. Nevertheless, all his descriptions about rise and fall of the money market, the bubbles and bursts, the liquidity and the constrained liquidity, the savings and loan crises, the real estate surge and recession, all lead to a pragmatic account of the money evolution. It is beyond one's ability to identify an element to describe the human thought process, be it culturally, politically, or spiritually. It is sort of a frightening dilemma, and therefore the book, The Ascent of Money, is confident to support the contents therein, and rightly asserts that planet finance is a force to reckon with. It is almost a transmutation approach, combined with a little amount of conscience. The last chapter of the book, viz. Chimerica, is quite critical as it throws light on the increasing conflict between China and America on economic fronts, which has a significant bearing on international trading. Ferguson leaves it to the elite class of readers to tag the book in the category of either to treat it as a finance in totality, then a financial history, and vice versa. Neil Ferguson 
contends that financial institutions are not diabolic. Maybe the rise of these entities in leaps and bounds will raise many individual eyebrows, accepting them as a hard proposition. The critics are not fundamentally opposed to the gist of the book, but the essence here is that they also follow other creations of similar nature, and Ferguson is expected to project a distinct set of arguments for readers to enjoy the contents of his book. Readers also individually acknowledge that Ferguson tries to make his points persuasive, citing that the misdoings of avaricious financiers are not the consequence of economic debacle, leading to mass exploitation of the common people and pushing them to the edge of the poverty line. Alternatively, he signifies that the yawning gap between the haves and have-nots is nothing to do with the manner of executions by the financial and structural shape of the lending institutions. It is rather the shroud of monopoly that looms large over the world economy. The need of the hour is to induct a plethora of banking and semi-banking financial institutions to break the shackles of monopolistic barrier that exists from time immemorial. To corroborate, Ferguson journeys back to the primeval era of civilization progressively in every chapter, and the reader is in a transitional mode, speeding past each milestone and entering the depth of the financial history. The relevant chapters deal with the inception of the banking system in the backdrop of Italian Renaissance, the advent of stock markets, the growth and dominance of shares, debitures, and bonds, the concept of investment on real estates, and so on. Ferguson is of the view that one cannot imagine the world bereft of the money influence, and if it is so, there is no point of living. As a responsible and affluent member of the society, any individual can make a self-judgment in terms of financial cause and effect. The critical terms like fractional reserve and arbitrage fade out eventually when one is deeply engrossed in the book. To make the chapters more interesting and enjoyable, Ferguson has enumerated plenty of anecdotes. One of the stories relates to a Scottish economist, viz. John Law, who was responsible for introducing the share market bubbles in light of his illogical promotion to the economy of Regency France. He frantically sold off stock in his newly formed Mississippi corporate. This was not the only instance. People observed more weird deeds in disdain. An eminent economist, viz. Colin Jones, accounted for them all in his book Eighteenth Century History of France, The Great Nation. Following it, was the book The Scottish Enlightenment by Arthur Herman, the latest publication being The World That Made New Orleans, authored by Ned Sublett, written in consideration of American perception. One can go through the story umpteenth time, but all the events and actions are sure to bounce back in bewilderment. Given the foregoing, the book by Neil Ferguson, The Ascent of Money, is decent enough in every aspect to impress upon an individual with rich contents in comprehending the financial sphere with a progressive mindset. As an honest reader, one cannot fathom the inch-by-inch -inch content of the book, but much of the intricacies have certainly been removed, and the reader can enjoy four, a smooth reading. antecedents before releasing the book. The most unique feature of this book is the embossing of the year of publication, 2008 on the inside cover. In a frenzied turn of the events, when the manuscript was handed over to the press and the first lot was published, Ferguson's hopes were shattered due to the initial lukewarm response. Ferguson was not at all diminutive. He tried to stay abreast in the backdrop of so many adverse events in 2008. One of them was the famous insolvency of Lehman Brothers Holdings Incorporated that shook the entire world which was then declared as the subprime disaster. It required a multi-trillion dollar bailout to steady the ship. After this financial upheaval, sanity prevailed, and the book, Ascent of Money, had gradually gained momentum and adjudged one of the best sellers in this niche. In hindsight, whatever may be explained in favor of the international finance bonding, people for a while grew skeptical about these financial institutions. Ferguson, for that matter, was always hypercritical and never accepted the fallouts of the mentioned financial debacle. He was straightforward in criticizing the said bailout and stressed that it was not a solution 
and against the established norms of finding cause and effect relationship. He rightly mentioned in his book that every threat to the monetary arrangement leads to a fatal consequence, even at the cost of economic stability. Neil Ferguson's wide-ranging policies of economic advancement may be limited to remain static, but it is very clear that the fallacies of statutory negligence are far more damaging than the unfortunate financial fiasco of 2008. He takes the onus on him and indicates that the progress of every era of civilization is due to sharpening of the financial tool, and that is nothing else but money, and to understand it, one should go for an all-out reading session. A few attempts have been made to shift the moral squabble about the present plight, but all in vain. It has been generalized that the writer's sense of time can also go berserk, Chapter like five. market volatility. Money is not the solitary solace. As the book is titled The Ascent of Money, one may conclude that the contents in the book are replete with only pecuniary constituents. However, the fact is that it is not only about money and about its evolution, but it is also the revelation of the passage through which money makes its way along with the premise that from the source of the historical view, money was the emblem of civilization. According to Ferguson, there is no element of ascendancy as money does not have a counterpart to take cognizance. The book virtually is a straight-line history of upfront financial marketing domains, and to that stretch it is enjoyable to read, deftly enveloping the stages from the barter system to coinage, from coinage to currency, and from currency to automated pre-programmed algorithmic trading. Ferguson makes a decent portrayal in touching the vast expanse of time realm that enables him to demonstrate that changing technology does not change the human mindset, even though he sometimes loses profundity by using the irrelevant figure of speech like a chunk of alliteration, pop references, and unnecessary puns. The book has the demerits of not reflecting on the evils of illegitimate financial institutions running parallel to the conventional money market. This truth should have been revealed in the book in the first place, because in its absence an individual seems to be at the crossroad of indecision. However, there are sporadic mentions of the narcotic regime and mafia infiltration and similar parallel economy, which have been duly admitted over time. Only this much has been accommodated and no more. The author's purpose is mainly to highlight all the facts concerning money and therefore other trivial things have not found enough space in the book. Alternatively, the critics can conclude that the book is neither partial nor foolproof. At best, it can be an account of trade and commerce, with money as the pivotal force behind all activities. The author is somehow not interested in taking stock of the businesses, which are not coming in the purview of public sector trading. Moreover, one cannot remember scanning a non-fictional publication with a low amount of postulations. Also, it lacks any all-embracing enactments or deliberately manifested standpoint. It is just the consistent movement of the economic evolution of financial history within an amplified framework. The critics say that there are other celebrated non-fictional works which have the leverage of more research-oriented contents in relevance to a strong sense of purpose than the subject book does carry within Chapter its six. self-sufficiency. Emphasis on Western Economy Criticism Similar to so many analytical creations, there is concluding summation wherein reciprocity has been drawn between fiscal policies and human organic evolution. Consequently, the author seems to be busy to collect the uses of metaphors scattered all over the book and assemble them in harmony. On the other hand, the motive behind creating this work is to compose a history, focusing primarily on Western history combined with macroeconomics, together with a final say on a concept reinforced by incidental recognitions. All these are found aplenty. The ingredients, which are compared with one another, are not destined to establish a set of theories when it is done for the sake of value addition. Moreover, the theory of evolution is not so reliable. For a professor at his stature, Ferguson might not have made justice in using the metaphor with a dynamic topic that alters as per his writing comfort line by line. 
it is doubtful whether money has augmented human growth. For that matter, have the idea of business and the market scenario changed for the better? The queries remain unanswered. The author repeats that the much-hyped technological transformation and remodeling have not succeeded to revolutionize the primitive barter system and the clutches of raw money lenders. Hence, the comparisons between the old and new form of money seem meaningless. The modern civilization has not emerged out clean from the shadows of the Middle Age menace. Besides, the author has analyzed the financial aspects on the grounds of ecological sustenance and macroeconomics are the bases. However, he pretends to study human actions with an impression of microeconomics, which is not true. The critics also contend that comparisons of money with human growth in a free market economy with rational sentience are not a realistic perception. The development of humankind over time is responsible for the fiscal orientation, and therefore human brain matters the most, not money. So many aspects of money need clarity. The critics are more or less justified having raised their pertinent queries. Without responding to these questionnaires, the book may be evaluated as an incomplete submission. Last but not least of the review is that there is a narrative about the movie Mary Poppins in the initial pages of the book, which is quite interesting to go through. The author also takes the mantle on his shoulder as he addressed an elite audience of business persons and explained why he had mentioned the movie in his book. He eloquently contended that the plot of the movie centered on the upheavals of contemporary British banks. In this way, Ferguson was able to redress the issues why he had drawn a broad picture of money in place of short-term financial gain, and thereby succeeded to rest all doubts of the aggrieved audience seven. in right earnest. Capitalism as an Effective Option Many critics relate money to the stock market. The greatest contribution of capitalism is the emergence of joint stock companies. With the formation of joint stock companies, the doors are open to raising a substantial capital from manifold sources so that a company can take shape and serve for the betterment of nation, including job opportunities for the people. The ideology of capitalism calls for an inherent risk. The more the element of risk, the greater will be the growth if other things remain constant. The argument is that even if one has enough capital to invest in building, say, a flyover, it will not be realistic to pour all money on a single venture. It will be too risky a proposition. It is better to collect a small amount from plenty of people and invest in various piecemeal projects. In this scenario, the risk of loss is largely reduced. In other words, the collective loss is better than the individual loss, as all stakeholders share the loss equally. The portions of this book are specifically worth leafing through when the reader comes to the finishing line, especially when Ferguson deals with behavioral economics. It is because man is predictably irrational. Here, it construes to be the hidden forces that prompt an individual to the process of decision-making. The very idea is interesting enough and it might have been more thrilling if the subject could generate more eagerness, backed by a set of the trustworthy theses with a scope of predictions. Setting aside all possible criticisms for a while, The Ascent of Money is largely very informative and resounding book, revealing the history behind money. There is a point of difference, albeit as to the emphasis on capitalism as the main tool of attaining financial glory. However, this book contains a detailed account of wide-ranging events that touch several milestones in the annals of the history of money. After all, it is a decent non-fictional story of accomplishments that have been narrated as the power of money to produce space with value addition, which is quite amazing. Neil Ferguson is better known as a historian who effortlessly wanders through the economic territory. Still, his almost all books are within the purview of historical facts. He, however, combines well the economic effects of history. In this particular book, the author narrates not so much about economics while reflecting on the financial growth. He vividly takes stock of so many aspects in seriatim, beginning with banks, then bonds, derivatives, equities, insurance, and ultimately, the reasons for credit constraints in the world is facing in recent times. 
The Ascent of Money is Ferguson's one of the best creations, as he deals with the facts that come naturally to him. He seems to have enough expertise in both ancient and modern bond markets. The inner revelation of the House of Rothschild, quantitative finance, the vanity of long-term capital management, and so on. The footnotes are quite appropriate, matching Ferguson's caliber and wisdom. His meticulous research is so extensive, collecting all possible materials ranging from personal records, financial journals, and important reference books of past and present history, which includes the famous book authored by George Soros. The title of the book, which relates to the financial history of the world, amply justifies his affinity toward capitalistic norms and long-term reforms, along with overall financial growth. Nevertheless, Ferguson is not an economist, rather a historian of repute. In the epilogue, the author is specific about money and terms it as the solidarity between a debtor and a creditor. But more specifically, it is the bonding of fidelity between a buyer and a seller. So far as real estate scenario is concerned, Ferguson is very curt to comment on this by saying that possession of landed property largely benefits a capitalist in a democratic system, but the real estate proceeds only favor the lender, not the borrower. The lender will always get the property back in case the borrower becomes defaulter, but the buyer is only safe if the property Conclusion. can generate income. Neil Ferguson is quite right. The world is in search of wisdom in the context of modern-day financial debacle. The days are gone to place an alarm clock by the investor's side and caution him not to invest in real estate, or suggest financiers for low-cost credit. However, one should take lessons from the past in the backdrop of ruins and wreckage of hedge funds, stock exchange brokers, banks, and other dilapidated financial institutions that still influence the global market domains. People should only look back when they can extract some virtues from the past. In addition, when the crossroads have disappeared and the situation warrants to forge ahead, the lessons from history have to be taken in the wallet for occasionally tips, so that past mistakes are reduced to zero tolerance. This hurried and unplanned work created by a British-born Harvard University scholar, Neil Campbell Ferguson, whose name was first caught the limelight ten years back, delivering his views on Rothschild banking dynasty, will add less than anticipated in discussing the subject scenario. Though the book, The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, has its strength, which accounts for macro effects of market economy together with the symbiotic collaboration between the USA and China, even though in early chapters that relate to money history, Ferguson is expected to propel his sense of judgment. The words have virtually failed to enliven one's expectations, either as an inspirational tonic or as a consequential narrative. Still, though, Ferguson's expertise, one can get familiar with the historical milestones with the help of fresh and sharper financial tools. All of a sudden, the period of Renaissance is enlarged to the public viewing. The demand for Italian art and artifacts was on the rise when the Italian bankers made use of Arabic mathematics. The elevation of the Dutch Republic was hailed as the moral victory of the world's maiden bond market over the bankrupt Habsburg absolutism. Also, the causes of the French Revolution were analyzed as an aftermath of the stock market bubble initiated by a Scottish buffoon, John Law. With the precise verbiage, Ferguson throws light on primary financial institutions and related ideas as to the source of their emergence. He raises appropriate questions and himself finds suitable answers for the benefit of the learned readers. What is money? What is the difference between a bond or a stock? What are the functions of a bank? What does a hedge fund do? Why purchase insurance and invest in real estate? He also narrates the history of the present world. He takes the readers to the post-Katrina New Orleans catastrophe to raise pertinent questions as to why the free market is constrained to facilitate enough coverage to the masses who are hit by natural calamity. Still, the central objective of the financial history entails that eventually every bubble will burst, every bullish buyer will remain a step behind the bearish seller, 
and every unholy ambition will turn into apprehension. And keeping these concepts in the mindset, one should perceive that it is time to take stock of the ascent of money, regardless of gait or gallop.